Hey guys, hope all is well. Um, happy Thursday. Um, Thursdays are always so great when you get when you get finished with them because you have Friday right around the corner and uh, and the weekend. So uh, it's always a big hurdle to get over Thursday. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I'm bringing this video to you uh, for Thursday night uh, with new ideas in mind, new plans in mind. Um, I've been thinking a lot about different things I've wanted to do with this channel. Um, I've gotten a lot of uh, great feedback from people that have uh, watched thus far, and I, I really appreciate that. And um, I really want to uh, have a series where I talked about uh, just sort of general things that could help you get better at chess. And when I was brainstorming, one of the things I thought about uh, was this contention. So bear with me. Uh, this is the contention I have. Um, the contention I have is that one of the things that separates uh, higher rated players from lower rated players, and it might be like a 1500 from a 1300 or 1700 from a 1500 or a 2000 from an 1800, might not actually be uh, the talent of the players, um, might not even be the level of hard work or diligence of the player, but rather the, the, the combinations of, of, of configurations that... Um, that the stronger player understands, or the higher rated player understands, or knows rather, than the lower rated player. So I'm going to repeat that again. It's not necessarily the talent, or even the amount of time invested in the game, but it might be the actual difference in the amount of configurations that one knows. And so, basically what I want to do with these videos is somehow bridge the gap in sort of explaining those configurations. And so um, I think a lot of times we try to, we're trying to consume all these, these chess materials and we're playing a lot of games, but a lot of uh, configurations or maneuvers and things like this, you really just uh, know or learn over time and they're not always explicitly taught. But if they were explicitly taught, you'd get a lot stronger really quickly because you'd understand why this is such a critical part of the game. So I think I haven't sort of figured out the name of the series exactly, but I think it's going to be something along the lines of like chess secrets you wish you knew or something like that. So in this video, I'm going to explain one of those chess secrets that you wish you knew. Um, and it's going to be a maneuver uh, that I like to simply call the rookie eight bishop f8 maneuver. Um, there isn't really a great name for it. I mean, maybe we can uh, we can think about a, a good name for the maneuver, and uh, that'd be nice. But in many openings, uh, Black is playing uh, the moves Rook E8 and Bishop F8, and it's a maneuver that's so critical, uh, really um, as a defensive maneuver, sometimes even as an attacking maneuver as well. And it's so critical that one understands that maneuver. So we're just going to look at a few examples and then talk about why it's valuable and and then move on from there. And So basically, uh, let's just look at this game really quickly. We're not going to go through the whole game, but we're just going to see where it happens. It's between uh, Emil Sotovsky and Gary Kasparov um, from 1998. So E4, C5, Knight F3, D6, D4. We have a Sicilian on our hands, uh, Nardorf to be exact, after Knight F6, Knight C3, A6, Bishop E2, E6. And this is a Shevenengen. I'm not so stressed about the opening right now. I want to just get to the, the really the critical moment. F4, bishop e7, castles, castles, a4, knight c6. By the way, this has been played tons of times, particularly when Gary was playing against Karpov. They played many, many systems just like this, um, or setups just like this. Uh, bishop e3, queen c7, these are all normal moves. King h1, and then here in this... In this position, we start this maneuver uh, with black plays rook e8. And it looks like a really strange move. Uh, if, if, you, if you haven't seen it before, it's like, why do you play rook e8 when the rook is, when the file, the file isn't open at all, and the rook uh, it just may not have any future prospects there? Um, and it's sort of a tough thing to answer. Uh, but the real reason is, is because at some juncture, the e-file might actually be open. So you can imagine maybe uh, white playing f5 at some juncture, and then all of a sudden e takes the f5 might be something uh, that, would that would at least be looked into or explored. 
Um, otherwise, it clears the way for this rook to go to bishop. Uh, this it clears the way uh, for this bishop on e7 to go to f8, and it's so critical. And I just want you to see why here. So rook e8, bishop f3, uh, and then bishop f8. Very important move. Uh, the bishop is now drawn back towards the king side. It's sort of helping and aiding the defense of black's king side. And also, if you notice, the rook on e8 cleared the e-file just a little bit more for the black rook. So sometimes uh, uh, black is really ready to open up that file by playing e5 at some juncture, or it just prophylactically defending the e6 square. And prophylaxis, for those that don't know that chess word, is essentially uh, making a, a preparatory defensive move, sort of an anticipation of something else. So let's just see. Bishop f8. Queen d2, knight a5, uh, and Kasparov, I guess, was going for the two bishops. Good move. Queen f2, knight c4. Uh, again, this is not really the purpose of the exercise, but it's a, to, this knight is now hitting the b2 pawn and the bishop on e3, so the bishop c1 back. And now look, e5. And now we see just how great this sort of bishop uh, this rook e8 and bishop f8 maneuver actually was. Because now black is first to the punch in the middle. This e5 break is coming with tempo, uh, mind you, attacking the knight on uh, d4. And uh, if, if, if there's a subsequent capture and after maybe e takes f4, maybe the knight gets the e5 square. Maybe the rook is pressuring the e4 pawn. So it really becomes, uh, in this case actually, uh, this maneuver really became something that was able to uh, lead to the, a thrust open in the center, a breaking open in the center. And we see here now Kasparov had taken over the initiative. Uh, and uh, very quickly, knight d2, now you see these white pieces retreating. And then d5, a very, very sharp and really, really nice move. Basically the idea being that uh, if e takes d5, e4 and the bishop on f3 is actually trapped. Um, and the same, similar, if knight takes d5, knight takes, e takes, and then e4, and uh, this bishop will have a really hard time finding a home after bishop h5, g6. I think that bishop is just trapped with a move like queen g3. Then there's the, actually the other part of this rookie eight, bishop f8 maneuver sometimes, is sometimes you can even redeploy the bishop on the longest diagonal, uh, which would be the h8 to a1 diagonal, and here, bishop g7 would just be the winning move securing the bishop. So I know that's sort of a lot to take in, at least from all the analytical and all these lines perspective, but just look at the key thing with this rook e8 bishop f8 and how it facilitated the activation of black's pieces. That's a really, really, really great maneuver. And again, after in this game, after d5, f takes, knight takes, now all of black's pieces were playing in the middle. White white pieces were had this bishop had gone back to c1. This uh, these knight had gone back to e2, and uh, very quickly uh, Kasparov took over the initiative and eventually won the game. So keep this maneuver in mind. Rook f8, bishop f8. I'm going to show you a few more examples. So check this out. Another game. Uh, this is a uh, Carlson Anand um, from 2008, before Carlson was world champion, uh, but he was still a studly player, and Anand was giving him fits in these days, and I'm sure Carlson knew this maneuver, you know this maneuver if you're a strong GM, but he really, really didn't react well. So again, this is another Sicilian, uh, Nardorf, um, I'm just going to zip through these moves a little bit, uh, till we get to sort of a standard position here, so you see the uh, Bishop e7, knight c6, castles, all these moves were black, queen c7, it's, queen 7 is really to reinforce defending the, the e5 push, because you really don't want white to be able to play e5, so that defends that. And king h1, another prophylactic move, getting the king off the diagonal. And now here, again, rook e8, really, really important move. And the beauty of it is, again, you're, you're preparing bishop f8, you're teeing up your rook against the e5 in case there are potential breaks, and you might even entertain e5 one day if white starts to go gung-ho with... Uh, uh, pawn storm. Another thing to point out with this rookie eight move is that f5 comes. Sometimes it does come. 
it's not really that great because the knight gets the e5 square, so knight e5 happens. But there's some positions I've seen where the e6 pawn becomes a real target because and it's attacked twice by the bishop, by the knight, and something else. And then again, so let's say, pretend, let's say, just for the sake of argument, this is not a good move, but bishop g4 and bishop f8 and bishop h3, just to just say this happened. It did, it's not, wasn't correct at all, but then this maneuver serves to overprotect the e6 pawn. So it really, really does have a lot of really nice uses. And the maneuver is really, really tried and true. And so in this game, rook e8 was played, bishop f3, we saw this before. Rook b8, uh, another prophylactic move because the bishop on f3 was trying to get off the line of the rook on a8. And then queen d2, and then bishop f8. And we see here, white is trying to tee up in the middle for some sort of pawn storm potentially, maybe some sort of avalanche. And black is ready to strike in the center if necessary. And just look what happened. Queen f2, bishop d7, g4. And that and see, g4 was the sort of the move where it's like, um, this is going to be another video at some point, by the way, but uh, probably another chess secret that, you know, many of you guys will know, but I, it cannot be emphasized enough. When there's a pawn, pu a pawn push on the flank, you push in the center. And another great example of that, because now white has opened and exposed himself on the, on the king side just a little bit, so you play e5, break open the center. And you can see this move is all the more, it, it's, it's, mo it's way more stronger than it would be because of this rook e8 and bishop f8 maneuver. So now we have e5 breaking open the middle, and after knight f5, bishop t e takes f4, bishop takes e4, and now you see the rook has permanent pressure on the e4 pawn, the knight has the e5 square, um, but really we see the purpose of the rook e8, bishop f8 maneuver. And additionally here, if we also point out, uh, the bishop is firmly secured, uh, the dark square bishop that is, away from the knight on f5 so that it can't be harassed. And so typically the dark squared bishop is a bishop you really, really value. Um, and uh, you see the bishop is doing an excellent job of defending both the d6 pawn and the g7 pawn. And so it cannot be stated enough how useful this maneuver is. So those were two Sicilian type of setups. Um, and... Uh, now I'm going to show you uh, another opening where it happens, because it really does happen in a myriad of systems. Um, so this is a, a game from 2015 from, uh, from the FIDE World Cup in Baku, uh, which uh, Kriakin actually went on to win and uh, qualified for the candidates tournament, um, where he challenged Carlson. But let's check this Rui Lopez line. E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6, Bishop E5. Hopefully we've seen this before. A6, bishop a4, knight f6. These are all normal Rui Lopez moves. Castles, bishop e7, rook e1, bishop b, b sorry, b5 first, bishop b3, castles. A little bit of a unique move order because this castles is sort of the martial move order, but that's another story, and we're trying to keep it real simple today. C3, d6, and then... Knight b uh, h3, sorry, uh, prophylaxis against bishop g4. Knight b8, uh, this rerouting of the knight with knight b8 is called the Briar variation of the Rui Lopez, um, if you want to look that up. Very solid and really, really popular system. Probably the most popular Rui Lopez besides the Berlin. So uh, d4, knight bd7, knight bd2, bishop b7. Bishop c2. The bishop c2 is a useful move because it protects the e4 pawn. Because uh, again, white wants to make this maneuver. Maybe we'll have maybe we'll have this in another video. Knight f1, knight g3. But white can't actually do that if the bishop if the bishop doesn't go to c2 because now this bishop on b7 is deployed. It's attacking the e4 pawn. So keep that in mind. Bishop c2. And now here we see the idea again. Uh, Svidler played rook e8 really, really key idea. And the point is, okay, a4 was played, uh, hitting that pawn, uh, but and then uh, and then bishop f8 is played. And we see again, the rook goes to e8, it reinforces, uh, in this case, protection of the e5 pawn. More importantly, it allows the bishop to step back to f8. And last but not least, it eyes, it indirectly eyes the e4 pawn, 
So white still can't play knight f1 because uh, it would it would hang a pawn after e takes d4. Uh, and then the rook and the knight and the bishop would all be lined up against the e4 pawn. So just to illustrate that, knight f1, e takes d4, and that's no good for, uh, for white because now this pawn on e4 is just loose and queen takes d4 wouldn't actually solve the problem because now black could play c5. And there's no way the queen can defend the pawn appropriately and not get in the way of the white bishop on c2 or the rook on e1. So what do we see here? Uh, rook e8 and bishop f8. Let's play through a, a few more moves just to see how it develops. Uh, bishop d3, attacking the b5 pawn. Um, this might be another video idea. Um, this is what I like to call positive pawn tension for white. Because black doesn't want to take on a4 because... Uh, black give, would give up the um, the A file and uh, uh, additionally uh, create another pawn island because then the A6 pawn would be isolated. So if B takes A4 here, um, let's say uh, let's say Rook takes A4 just for the sake of example, this this A6 pawn is now at, uh, by itself and it's uh, island. So now White has created Black has created an extra pawn island for no reason, and so. Uh, C6 is sort of the, the logical move just to sort of not create the island. And now this is still pot, what I like to call positive pawn tension for white because white can take whenever he wants and black doesn't really ever want to take. So queen C2, rook C8, both sides are just developing. But notice that at some juncture, uh, black can open up the middle and with this rook E8, bishop F8 maneuver, Think about pressuring e4, and that's exactly what happened. Because after a takes b5, a takes b5, b4, white played c5. And all of a sudden, after b takes c5, e takes d4, very, very nice tactical resource by uh, Spiddler. The rook is open against the e4 pawn. The rook on c8 is lined up against queen on c2. And all of black's pieces are concentrated uh, in the middle of the board. But more importantly, so much of this is facilitated by this rook e8 and bishop f8 maneuver. So here, uh, it got a little bit sharp and tactical, but uh, Stidler came uh, out of the tactical phase pretty okay. And, uh, okay, he shouldn't have uh, won this game. He actually did go on to win uh, quite amazingly because um, Stidler, because uh, uh, Karyakin blundered, and that was that. But I think it's important to note just how great this rook e8 bishop f8 maneuver was facilitated. So, uh, keep, again, this was from a Roy Lopez. Uh, let's look at another Roy Lopez where that happened. Um, this is a game between uh, Duda and... Was it? Who was it between? No, that's not... This is the wrong game. Give me a second. Yeah, this is the game I was looking for between Duda and Michael Adams. Duda's a young t Polish talent uh, from 2015. This is so we have another Rui Lopez. Develop our pieces. This is all theory. Um, another Briar variation. Um, another uh, we all saw this in the last game. And again, Rook e8. Knight f1. Here, Knight f1 actually is okay because. The bishop is not on f8 yet, so e takes d4 is a threat yet. But you see, after bishop f8, now this taking on e4 is a threat. So white has to go knight g3, protecting that pawn and getting those nice knights on the king's side. And then black goes g6 to cover up the f5 square. And uh, and again, here we actually see the rook e8, bishop f8 maneuver again. And we see this other thing that was similar to one of the Sicilian, um, uh, Sicilian positions we looked at, where now after... Rook e8, bishop f8. If black does elect to play g6, then the bishop can come to g7, where it has influence on a new diagonal. So uh, the maneuver can also allow for this fiat shadow of, of the bishop, and it really can be quite useful there and quite an influence. Um, just in this game, we could, uh, if we play a little bit more, a4, c5. That was that. This is, by the way, this uh, positive neg negative pawn tension on the queen side. You can see here as well. It's a theme in many, many Rui Lopez structures, but c5, d5, c4. I'm just going to play through more of these moves. Um, very complicated game, but you see now this bishop came to g7, where it serves as uh, an extra piece around black's king, which is really, really helpful in case white decides to open the position up on the king side.
and uh, after lengthy maneuvering, it became the only piece that Black had on the king's side to defend his king, and a very valuable one. And, uh, well, the game was very long. I'm not going to go over the whole thing. But, again, rookie 8, Mishpef 8. Now, another, 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 another example of this is um, we, we looked at Sicilian. We looked at E5. <laughs> now we're going to look at crazy, 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 crazy Philidor. So let's see what happens here. Uh, Ivan Shuk versus Mamed Yarov. Uh, Ivan Shuk versus Mamed Yarov. Mamed Yarov is always uh, quite a trickster with his chess, and he plays sharp openings. And this was a rapid game, but it's still a valuable example of this maneuver. So here, uh, Philidor, d6 after knight f3. Uh, e takes, knight takes, knight f6, knight c3, bishop b7. Bishop c4. This is this, The thing that's cool about this, too, is this is by far the most popular reply, I think, against the Philidor. So this is not so it's not so hard to see. And then castles, bishop b3, um, knight bd7, castles, knight c5, rook e1. Like the b4 pawn need to be protected. C6 to cover the d5 square um, because the knight or the uh, might have landed there and eyed that square. Bishop f4, and then here we have it, the, our favorite maneuver, rook e8. And again, now it's a, similar to the other lines where the rook on e8 is looking at the e4 pawn. The bishop will come back to tuck back on f8, and all will be good. And so queen d2, bishop f8, and already uh, black's position is pretty... Um, I'm not going to... Black isn't better than anything, but it's just very comfortable to play. Um, black's bishop is tucked on f8. Uh, you know, white's, uh, white has something to deal with with the e4 pawn. And here white played f3, which... Is not a move you necessarily want to have to make because it does weaken this whole diagonal and some of the dark squares around the king. And, uh, well, Shakyar played well around that. He developed, he established himself, he got all of his pieces out, and then he, uh, he won the game eventually. And he had this d5 break, which is really critical because it opened up the structure. The rook on e8 was uh, appropriately uh, ready for that break. The bishop on f8 was tucked behind, protecting the knight, and just really solidly placed there. And uh, and he went on to win the game. But you can see that here, the rook e8, bishop f8 maneuver, again, facilitated the play. Another example, he had another example from the Philidor, uh, I will show, is uh, between uh, Joseph Gallagher um, and Ruslan Ponomaryov, former FIDE uh, world champion. And again, we're going to have a Philidor, knight f3, d6, d4, takes, takes, knight f6, knight c3, bishop b7, g3. And here, uh, um, yeah, this is a Fianchel line of the Philidor. It's a different line than the other stuff where the bishop was coming to c4. But again, the maneuver is still valuable. So here we see castles, bishop g2, rook e8 right away, castles, c6 to cover the all-important d5 square h3, uh, that's a, a, a good prophylactic move to cover the g4 square, actually. And, um, and now, knight a6. Again, the knight is sort of looking at c5. It's not, uh, it's a little bit of a finesse than knight bd7, because now the bishop on c8 is actually controlling the f5 square. So if, if uh, black went knight bd7, that'd actually be a mistake here, because knight f5 would hit this bishop on d7 and the pawn on d6, and you wouldn't be able to keep both. So that's why knight a6 was played, rook e1, and then the maneuver again, bishop f8. And you could see the rook again, hitting the e4 pawn, uh, eyeing it. Uh, white has a little bit more space in the structure, but black is the black king side is really more secure with this bishop on f8. And uh, Ponomarev won a nice game, then he played knight d7, another nice maneuver, bringing this knight to e5. Um... And they got another knight to c5, and he just sort of slowly maneuvered and established his pieces, and everything was in the middle. And then he sort of turtled a little bit here. Again, white still is the space. Probably isn't too, too much worse, if, if worse at all. Um, but just sort of waited for white to sort of, sort of be overly aggressive, and then eventually uh, got the break that he was looking for. And, uh, yeah, then f5. And we can see that the bishop here, it wound up on... 
g7 with the rook e8 bishop f8 maneuver the rooks are all crazily crazily effectively deployed here and the game ended remarkably quickly after that break um let's see now all of the rook another rook came on e8 the bishop's on g7 and all of you can just see the concentration of black's forces is huge um and uh, here gallagher blundered he played knight takes e6 which so doesn't work because after queen takes bishop takes he missed this check i think because after king g1 96 uh now black is just up a piece and the knight on c3 is still attacked f5 another blunder because it allows bishop e5 and then f takes e6 bishop takes e6 g3 bishop d4 check 95 and the game was over because black's up a queen and threatening to among other things queen h2 but again the point is this maneuver and i just want to show and emphasize uh, again and we could go back rook e8 castles bishop f uh, c6 h3 96 rook e1 and bishop f8 and the bishop and the rook really are appropriately deployed so what is the conclusion from this maneuver because we've looked at it in three different openings now uh for uh, from the black side we looked at it looked at it in the sicilian we looked at it in the Philidor, and we looked at it in uh, the Roy Lopez structures. And so uh, if we could take a few conclusions from it, I think there are a few things we can draw. One, um, a lot of these uh, are a lot of these lines are um, are connected to sort of uh, not what I would call dark square openings necessarily, but openings where the the pawn break is connected to the d4 square. So uh, if you look at the Sicilian, that's a pawn break where d4 is the is where where the, all the action comes from. That's where uh, the the pawn break is connected to that square. If you look at the Philidor, same thing. D4 is like the pawn break connected to that square. It's sort of like it's sort of like d4 and e5 squares, right? Same thing with the Ruy Lopez. And I think in a lot of these openings. Uh, uh, the bishop on uh, the dark square bishop in particular for black is able to be tucked here because that's just how the structure sort of is set up. The bishop is on e7 in a lot of these lines, so that's why it eventually goes to f8. So that's why it works. Um, you're not going to see rook at rook e8 bishop f8 in an uh, opening like the uh, like the French or uh, the Karakhan, or rather you you probably shouldn't see it in those openings because the break is connected, the pawn break is connected to the light squares there. It's connected to e4 and d5. So the rook e8, uh, bishop f8 maneuver is probably not as likely there. Um, uh, I think another thing that we noticed is that um, it's an attacking and defensive maneuver at the same time. It's primarily defensive, but it really helps to facilitate the fluidity and the development of the piece, deployment of the pieces, because the rook goes to the e-file. The bishop is able to establish itself in a, in a, sort of defensive deployment initially in F8, but sometimes we see it can go to G7, and then it has that really long diagonal. Additionally, I, I didn't point this out, but a lot of openings and a lot of times you see, not in the openings, but you see a lot of times uh, in, in, in amateur games, uh, back reg mates become a problem. And one of the things I love about rookie 8, bishop F8, is that you're, there's no sort of checks on your king with tempo on the back rank, because the bishop is covering that, uh, is covering the back line, and I love that from a tactical tactical perspective. When you're playing and uh, you ha you're calculating some lines, and you have to worry about losing a tempo or having to safeguard your king for a moment because you've already prophylactically done that with the maneuver. Um, those are the things that come to mind immediately. Um, uh, but um, but yeah, I think those are sort of the things that are really really key. And I'll tell you. Um, this maneuver is something that you see in so many games, and uh, I, I can remember when I was uh, uh, much lower rated and uh, around 16, 17, 1800, I had no idea why this was the case, why this deployment, why this maneuver was the case. It wasn't until I started to look at some Kasparov-Karpov games and some of their Matt World Championship matches where I actually started to understand just by trial and error, not even because someone told me, just because I saw it enough, it made sense to me. I could explain it to myself eventually. Um, I'm giving you the secrets right here. So um, so there you have it. Um, that is officially, I guess you could say, 
the the first uh, version of this sort of series of sort of secrets that you wish you knew, maneuvers that you wish you knew. And um, I hope you uh, try and uh, employ it in your games because it's super, super effective. So thanks for watching. Be with you soon.